We are, of course, a DC local DC nonprofit that is the affiliate to the, the DC, equivalent of the DC state affiliate to the National Endowment for Humanities. This is our 31st year, and we work in the humanities across Washington, DC. Um, what are the humanities? History, literature, ethics, philosophy, language, um, legal, cultural traditions, basically what defines us as the human tradition. Our focus is on DC local history, heritage, and culture. And what we particularly try to do is to bridge many of the divides in Washington, D.C. through the humanities by bringing uh, people together from across the district and having you all uh, interact. I always think of us as one of the key kind of quiet catalysts in the city for the last 31 years, being able to try to help spark connections that you all then take and, and run with. Hello, everyone. Hi. My name is Pennington Green, and my project is a film. The film is called uh, Supreme Courts, and she talked about bridging the different uh, gaps as far as Washington, D.C. is concerned. I find that this film really bridges the gaps between demographics, old, new, young, old, black, white, and uh, from doing a lot of research, we went back to the early 1900s and found E.B. Henderson, who was quite a pioneer and uh, first black PE teacher in Washington. And his concept was if we can get blacks into Ivy League schools, they go with two skills, academics and uh, athletic skill. And once we get on the field with white, our white counterparts, a lot of the stereotypes that exist between black and white will go away. So he had that vision 100 years ago. And obviously athletics and sports is a way for to even the playing field and to create uh, equality among different cultures. So he had that vision early. So we're highlighting E.B. Henderson, but some of the other folks that play basketball in Washington you would never think of, like Maury Povich played basketball in Washington, D.C. Al Gore played basketball in Washington, D.C. Pat Conroy, the great uh, author, played basketball in Washington, D.C. James Brown from CBS. So whereas most basketball stories are kind of playground stories, we want to talk about the disciplines that sport, that you learn from sport, and how that translates into success in life and I like success in academics. And a prime example is we have a letter from uh, Dr. Charles Drew to E.B. Henderson, thanking him for the disciplines he learned through basketball, and that he was not going to just be another black doctor in the black community, but he was going to take the medical industry by storm internationally. That's before he created blood transfusions and the blood uh, and saved million lives, hundreds of lives in World War One. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Great. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Corey. Shimka from DC Scores. Uh, DC Scores is an after school program at 26 elementary and middle schools and we combine soccer and poetry and service learning. Um, and this grant funds twice weekly poetry workshops for our 800 students and also funds the largest youth poetry slam in Washington DC. Hi, um, my name is Sara Tiosa. I'm the director and producer of the Red Line DC project. Um, it's a documentary project that I'm doing that's been sponsored by Words, Beats, and Life Inc., a local nonprofit um, that together will be basically interviewing commuters and graffiti writers, um, basically stakeholders that are involved with um, graffiti on the Red Line, talking a bit about that space, um, what's going on there, its history, um, and that's basically it. Good evening. 
My name is Akil Ali. I'm with People's Production House, and we have a youth group which is called Radio Roots. It's a youth-run radio production um, program, and we focus on media literacy, journalism, to underserved uh, students within the D.C. area. Right now, we are serving <coughs> students at Bell Multicultural High School and at the C Public Charter School in Southeast. And this summer we are taking on, embarking on a journey basically to, um, we're going to do some research in a biography on Board One due to the rich history, the culture, uh, the nature, and it being the most diverse ward in D.C., we decided to do a living biography which will entail um, actual residents, people who work there, establishments, mm -hmm. because of such a rich history. And the majority of our students actually live in Ward 1. And we have also, um, at this point, we're partnering with PBS to do a piece on high school dropouts. And this piece will focus on truancy, uh, immigration, gang and crew involvement, which are some of the risks or major risks of dropouts in our war, which, which is war one. And we have one of the highest statistical rates of counselor to student ratios in war one and four being at Roosevelt Cardozo, 650 students to one counselor. So how do we have our students succeed? That's by getting them involved and having them be that voice for their future. Hi, my name is Farah Fassay, and I work with the Latino Economic Development Corporation, and we got a grant to make a 15-minute documentary um, about the story of tenant purchase. It's called We Own This, and it tells the story of how tenants in the District of Columbia have used a unique law that we have called the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act to preserve their affordable housing, to prevent displacement, and to build community. And it follows um, a few stories that take place in different parts of the city. Um, my name is Jen Goldsmith. I'm here with the Studio Theater. Um, we were awarded a grant as part of our New Ireland, the Enda Walsh Festival, to provide symposium events, bringing all different panelists from across the city and across the country to come and speak in a fashion that would contextualize some of the works of this playwright that we were producing. Um, there, they were very, there, there were three plays that we had, Penelope, um, the New Electric Ballroom, and the Walworth Farce, all very British, all very <laughs> Irish, all very European, all very outside the American tradition of drama. Um, so we felt the need to provide free public programs that would give people a sense of how this fits into the new tradition of Irish arts, the ages old tradition of Irish theater, and what it is for the performers and the artists involved to work on pieces that are this outside of the American tradition uh, while operating in an American city as a theater. Um, so as a part of this, we brought Professor Michael Cadden down from Princeton to speak on a panel. Um, he was joined by Professor George O'Brien from Georgetown University, and that panel was moderated by Ari Shapiro. So that is specifically the, the piece of this that was funded by the council. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Cindy Tikhabib, and I'm a filmmaker. And um, the grant is going to help with the screening of a new documentary I produced called A Community of Gardeners. And um, the documentary focuses on the people who grow fruits and vegetables at seven different <coughs> community gardens here in DC. And um, it shows the powerful impact that they have on people's lives and their communities and their environment. And um, it also includes a history of community gardening in the US from the 1890s to the present. And it recently premiered at the Environmental Film Festival here in DC. So the screening is going to um, be at Busboys and Poets, and it's going to include a post film discussion on m many of the issues addressed in the film, such as food security and youth and gardening and immigrants and how these gardens provide them with a link to their native countries and gardens, places of healing, all those types of issues. And we're going to bring in organizations that are involved in community gardening projects in the city to um, talk about these issues and to engage the audience. Hi, I'm Sharon Rankins with the Anacostia Community Museum. Uh, we're in the small grant category and we're working on a project called Community and Creativity, looking at creativity east of the Anacostia River. We're actually opening an exhibition on the 
in August of, of 2011, um, and it has a number of parts, but uh, initially we're looking at uh, the creativity of an artist in Anacostia called B.K. Adams. We're looking at uh, a couple of creators, uh, Melanie Douglas and Steve Cummings, and then we're looking at a broad stroke across community organizations and creators, including Albus Cavus, um, a, a, a tattoo artist in, in Anacostia brought the New York style of tattooing to Washington, D.C. Um, a, a, a people in theater, who I see in our audience today, um, and a number of uh, artists and creators um, in Southeast Washington. And we were awarded um, this particular grant to create community forums to talk about creativity east of the Anacostia River. And the forum series that we put together are, um, the first one is um, Southeast Churches, Conduits for Creativity. Uh, the other, the second is um, Creativity and uh, Youth Culture. The third is um, Public Art in Southeast, Asset or Stigma. And the fourth is looking at uh, youth and, and creativity east of the Anacostia River. Um, so this, these forums bring together stakeholders, um, participants, decision makers to talk about um, issues that affect creativity in, in east of the Anacostia River. So I hope you all will Come and join us. My name is Sarah Hackey, and I'm the director at an organization called Facing History in Ourselves, which is an education nonprofit that works with young people to get them to make the vital connection between history and the moral choices they make in their own lives. We work with middle and high school students around the area. The project that was funded by the Humanities Council is called Choosing to Participate. It's an exhibition and community engagement program that, again, like Facing History, asks young people to make the link between particular <coughs> stories from history, like um, the Little Rock Nine and the desegregation of Central High School, and to think about the choices that they make in their own lives to impact the, their own decision making and their understanding of his history. Um, we have a deep partnership with the Historical Society where the exhibition had opened in February and runs through June where we have thousands of local uh, students coming through the exhibit. Thank you. Hello. I'm Pat Tyson and I'm with the Military Road School Preservation Trust. We are doing a um, program that will involve the sesquicentennial year. And since we are a Civil War uh, background, our topic is a tribute to Senator Charles Sumner, who was a senator that was almost caned to death on the Senate floor as an abolitionist for equality for all people. But also, the Civil War was a defining factor of the moral character of America. And the second part of this program is called Prejudice is Still Alive. 150 years after the Civil War, Prejudice is Still Alive and Well. And we want to uh, bring in people who can talk to us about what we have to do to help strike the blow to this problem. And it's, are you part of the problem or part of the solution? And so we're very thankful to the council for helping us to uh, fund this project. It will be here at the uh, Sumner Museum and Archives. And usually people, when you say that, they right away they think of the parking problem. Well, we're going to try to alleviate that for you this time and have to provide parking for all of the participants who will come to the program. We hope this is going to be a, not only an enjoyable uh, program, but one that will really strike a blow and help us go back to our respective communities or various entities and try to overcome this problem. Thank you. Hopping up here. Uh, my, name is, my name is Rachel Grossman. I'm here with the Woolly Mammoth Theater Company, and um, we're delighted to have the Humanities Council be supporting the giant explosion expansion um, the, of our programming that we're doing around a remount of the play of Clyburn Park this summer. Um, we produced Clyburn Park first 
uh, in March of 2010 and had a series of select programs both in the theater um, and through some social media where we posed the question, is your neighborhood Clever Park? Because the play really deals with the, um, with the changing face of neighborhoods, um, looking at one house and the way a neighborhood flips um, from being uh, predominantly white to predominantly African American to going, we assume, to predominantly white again over a course of 50 years. Um, so uh, the conversation really exploded everywhere um, and we were super excited. So we are hosting uh, us and curating a series of discussions both on site in the theater, um, out in the community, and through social uh, network, um, through social media platforms to really, really further engage this and look at comparative studies between neighborhoods here in the district, um, between the district and the suburbs, um, the way artists are interpreting and telling the, the story of the changing face of our neighborhood, both from a changing face and a changing building face. Um, and uh, so certainly you should all come. Please come see me. I would love to have you participate. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Maurice Carney. I am the um, executive director and co-founder of an organization called Friends of the Congo. And we uh, raise global consciousness about the situation in the Congo and provide um, support for local institutions inside the country. And we uh, received a grant, a um, small grant, in order to work in um, collaboration with the um, Humanities Council's Live to Read program, as well as uh, a very special play uh, that's uh, being presented at uh, Arena Stage called Ruined, um, developed by um, playwright Lynn Nottage, who won a Pulitzer Prize uh, for the play, which um, focuses on, on the challenges that uh, women inside the Congo face and uh, how they overcome those challenges in an environment of um, war and conflict. Um, so where Friends of Congo comes in in uh, the Live to Read program, which has the book of the play being read by the high school students and the play itself, is that we provide um, social, historical, and cultural context to the play itself um, while ex exposing the young people, the students, the youth in particular, um, to the Congo, uh, its importance uh, to the African continent as a whole, and also the links that Congo has with um, modern society. Uh, a major reason for the conflict in the country, uh, which is the deadliest in the world since World War II, and um, arguably the greatest humanitarian crisis um, that we face at the dawn of the 21st century with nearly six million people dying in that uh, war since 1996. Um, major source of it is a scramble for a mineral called coltan. And when that mineral is refined and processed, um, it is used in our cell phones and other electronic devices, such as the video games that young people play, Nintendo Wii, Sony PlayStation, Microsoft Xbox, and a number of other um, devices that um, make our modern society function. So. We provide workshops um, for the, the students, um, community forums um, for the community as a, as a whole, and um, uh, basically um, to share with people uh, what is taking place in the Congo, why it's important or why it matters to each and every one of us, and how young people in the community uh, as a whole uh, can get involved in raising global consciousness about the situation and also um, working in concert with Congolese to bring about a solution to the challenge that they face. And really, which is not just a Congolese challenge, but uh, a human challenge, because whenever that many people die on the face of the earth, each and every one of us uh, should be engaged using our talents, our skills, our expertise, our know-how to at least say something about it and uh, use those talents and skills to try and bring about change uh, in the Congo, just as Lynn Nottage has done with her play, Ruined. So that's the essence of our program. Uh, we're at friendsofthecongo.org, and uh, should you wish to find out more about what we're doing, forms that we're holding, and how you can get engaged in one fashion or another, um, please see me after, after the program. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. How are you? 
I'm Beverly Lindsay Johnson, president of the National Hand Dance Association, and uh, our mission is to preserve, educate, and promote the art form of hand dance. And for those who don't know what hand dance is, it's a contemporary swing style, swing style dance form that it has a nearly 60-year tradition here in Washington, D.C. It is the official dance of the District of Columbia by resolution of the City Council, or the D.C. Council, excuse me. And um, in 2010, we received the D.C. Heritage, Community Heritage Grant to produce a documentary on the evolution of hand dance. And that documentary is called Hand Dance, A Capital Swing. And you can see it on YouTube. It's a part of the uh, YouTube um, videos that they have mounted or posted, rather. And so the grant that we just received from the Humanities Council was to have a public screening of the documentary um, Hand Dance, A Capital Swing. And then afterwards, to have a panel discussion uh, bringing forward people in the communities who, whose lives are impacted by the um, art form of hand dance as, you know, generations of Washingtonians are hand dancers. And then um, afterwards, what else do you do but you, you have a hand dance party? <laughs> so that's what we did and we brought that event to the Chateau, which is one of the premier hand dance clubs in Washington, D.C in Ward 7, and um, we invited Mayor Vincent Gray, who is an old school hand dancer from Dunbar High School, and he was there, and we also invited um, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, who is also an old school hand dancer from Dunbar High School, and um, they came and they had a few words, and Mayor Gray, we put it to the test. <laughs> and he got out there and he did his hand dance thing. And the event was absolutely fabulous. We had about 200 people there, um, much more than we thought were going to come. And um, the feedback, we did evaluation forms, and all the feedback was absolutely positive. Not one negative feedback form in the whole bunch. So we were really, really fortunate to have a wonderful program. And if you can, um, the Washington Informer was there, and they put a photograph of our event in, I guess it's, it might be the week, last week's um, uh, Washington Informer, but if there's an archive, you might be able to find the photograph. But anyway, so we're, we're grateful to be receiving this grant today. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Meg Poole with the 9-11 Unity Walk, and the Unity Walk was formed seven years ago as a peaceful response to the tragedies of 9-11. And since then, annually on or near September 11th each fall, um, people gather along Embassy Row. There happens to be kind of a, a beautiful placement of all different types of houses of worship. People come together to walk together as a statement of unity to explore what unites us rather than divides us. And um, what I like to think about is the greatest benefit of the Unity Walk is that it really brings you together to learn about somebody from a different faith or a different background. Um, this, well, recent events have kind of put forth uh, the question to everyone, what are they going to be doing on September 11th? This is the 10th anniversary. And we would really like to increase the outreach um, the, to get other people across the city to the event. And um, the grant from the Humanities Council will enable us to help do that. And then we've also asked Ambassador Akbar Ahmed, a uh, professor at American University, to help lead us through um, kind of a, an evaluation after the event, um, but to bring people back together to tell some of the stories and uh, testimonials about what they experienced that day. Um, we're proud to say that the event really pushes people to um, have their own experience. Um, we don't script it for people, um, but encourage people to go up to somebody that they don't know, somebody from a different faith tradition um, that they don't know anything about. Um, the Unity Walk provides a space for people to enter different houses of worship, um, go into the mosque. Maybe many people in Washington have never been inside of a mosque or inside of a Sikh Gudwara. So it's all different kinds of experiences like that, and we're very grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Hi, I'm Antoinette Ford, Double Nichols Theater Company. And our purpose is to celebrate the well-lived life of seniors. 
And in celebrating their lives, what we do is collect those stories from your grandparents and great-grandparents and everyone still alive, take those stories, bring them together, and dramatize them. This grant that we've been so graciously offered by the Humanities Council will allow us, in partnership with the Armed Forces Retirement Home, as well as the German Historical Institute, to collect the stories and celebrate the contributions of African-American veterans of World War II. We are finding them in wonderful, wonderful places and reinforcing their stories of the uh, Red Ball Express and the contributions they made there and a number of other historical contributions. In November, in fact, specifically November uh, 26, we will take those stories with the men and, and women who have given us those stories as far as possible and have them uh, dramatized on stage at the Lincoln Theater, thanks again to the Humanities Council. Uh, with that, what we'll be able to do is share with you the men and women who gave us those stories and where they don't participate because of age or fatigue or whatever, we have an age exchange program. We have young people who would have been about the age they were when the event took place act their part. So thank you very much. Hi, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Shakir Mohammed, and I'm with AIC. Uh, American Islamic Congress. Uh, what we do is we are a civil rights organization uh, promoting tolerance between Muslims and also uh, people from a different faith. Uh, with the money, with the grant that we get from the humanities, we actually just hosted um, a Muslim film festival here in Washington DC and also in our sister office which is in Boston. So what we do is we actually, um, you know, bringing uh, films that actually incorporate, you know, the current situation that is happening in the Middle Eastern, mostly, you know, in the Muslim countries. And, 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 and then, you know, we make sure that the films incorporate ideas regarding, you know, the socioeconomic aspect of it and also what is happening right now, with the, you know, when it comes to political unrest that is happening in the Middle Eastern countries. Um, so by, 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 by screening these films, we also invite the producers and also, you know, um, uh, people who are involved in the, in, the, in the film. And then, you know, that would give uh, people to have the opportunity, you know, to talk about the film and then, you know, to have that a panel discussion right after we screen the, the films. So uh, this has been going on for the last four, for, for the last four years. So um, for this time, we had 12 screenings between uh, Boston and also in Washington, D.C. So, um, and, and then and our audiences were actually close to 900 people. So it was a big success. So I would like to thank Humanities Council for um, the funding for this. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nicole Howard. I'm the director of the Children's Gallery of Mommy CLC, Mentors of Minorities in Education Total Learning System. And um, thanks to the Humanities Council, we're continuing the mobile gallery that we do. Um, it's an extension of our child series uh, that we do, great person series that we do during our after school program that concentrates on um, African American leaders and also global leaders as well. And this year's theme was standing up for uh, global justice during Civil War, um, based on the Civil War uh, anniversary as well as um, uh, SALA organization. Every year they have a new uh, theme, so this year's was Civil War. War. And um, we bring the mobile gallery to after school programs, churches, community centers, wherever it has a space for us. Um, actually today, we just went to KIPP, um, school near Anacostia and we reached over 200 students with the gallery. So it's a hands-on interactive way for children to learn about black history as well as different uh, global stories. And so uh, we thank you so much for uh, continuing to help us to bring the gallery to students and we want to continue to, to expand and reach more students and go to more schools. And today we were able to do a school from about I think 10 a.m. to about almost 4 o'clock. So we really get a chance to reach a lot of people. So it helps us to reach even more students. So thank you. Hello, I'm Marie Mall, and I'm from the Latin American Youth Center's Art and Media House. And the funding from the Humanities Council is supporting our end of summer exhibition. And this year, every year, our summer program is called Second Nature, and it's a partnership with the National Park Service. And each year, we pick a theme, and then young people explore that through creative mediums. And this summer, as many of the projects before me, um, we're looking at DC Civil War, looking from the, at the Civil War through civil rights. 
Um, young people are using creative mediums that existed at the time. We're, we're doing photography, printmaking, bookmaking, and oration, theater, and poetry. And we'll, they'll be using DC as their resource, collecting stories, but also reflecting on the issues and the stories that they have in relation to the things that come up or rise up from that, and then putting on an exhibition and performance at the end of the summer, which will be in early August. So thank you. Well, um, I'm uh, Brian. Brian Annis, I'm with uh, Ford's Theater Society, and uh, the grant that we are receiving um, is covering our Civil War Washington Teacher Fellows Program, which is a program that covers 25 DC teachers. Um, they come to Ford's uh, for a five-day seminar that really helps them understand how to use uh, the locations around DC um, to help teach their students about the Civil War in a much more impactful way. And ultimately, we uh, will reach about 1,500 students, and we hope um, that many of those students will eventually be able to come back to uh, Ford's Theater to, um, to take a field trip and, and learn more about our history and, and the history of the city that they live in. Thank you. I'm Megan Fritz, and I'm with the Corcoran Gallery of Art. Um, this grant, grant helped to fund our family festival called DC Color Splash. Uh, the Family Festival was held in March, and um, it was a festival that was centered around one of our exhibitions, um, the Washington Color and Light Exhibition, and that exhibition featured um, all artists from Washington, D.C. in the 60s that were part of a movement called the, or a school called the Washington Color School. Um, and some of those artists included uh, Sam Gilliam, Alma Thomas, and uh, Jean Davis. And so um, all of the activities for the day were based on the techniques used by those artists. And since all the artists um, were also from DC, it was kind of like a celebration of, of creativity in DC. So we were able to bring in various community groups. Um, and we had a group from the Sitar Center um, we, that had a, an interactive drum circle, as well as um, a, a band called the Saints Band from the Sitar Center. And we also had um, uh, an organization, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name of the organization. We have very di various different groups come in that we were able to, to help host the activities throughout the day. Um, and it was a huge success. We had over 3,500 people through our doors, and it was completely free uh, for the public all day. So we're very appreciative. Um, thank you all. This was really, for me, the most interesting part, and I hope you all found it as well. Um, what you've heard was kind of a real cross-section of all over DC, organizations large and small, looking at the history, engaging the youth towards the future, um, really looking at what, what makes us the city, what makes us the District of Columbia, and as you notice, that there's, we uh, had a particular emphasis this time on the Civil War, on after-school programs, as well as on immigrant communities all of which make up the whole fabric of what is Washington, D.C.